Eagle stared out of the window of his darkened room into the neighborhood, the sun sinking below the horizon, casting long shadows on the manicured lawns. It was Friday night, and his parents would be leaving for their weekly dinner party at the Johnson's house, a few streets away. As the youngest child, Michael had been deemed mature enough to stay home alone for the first time, and he was excited about the prospect of having the house to himself after bedtime. However, the nagging pangs of loneliness that came with being alone in the big old house could not be ignored. Michael spent the early evening organizing plans for the night of fun and mischief ahead. He thought about Prank calling his friends under the guise of trying to reach his parents on their business phones. But the thrill of mischief and the intoxicating feeling of his newfound independence were quickly overshadowed by the fear of the unknown and the loneliness that came with being alone in the darkened room. Michael's first call was to his friend Tim, whose laughter filled the phone as he answered, and then realized he was being pranked. Michael's heart raced as he listened to his friend's confused reactions and played into the ruse, but the rush of empowerment he felt from successfully fooling Tim was quickly replaced by the fear and loneliness that had been building since the beginning. Michael's next call was to Seth, who adopted a gruff voice to pretend to be Michael's scowling father on the line. Michael could hear Seth's anger at being pranked, but he smiled as he realized the ruse had worked and that he had successfully fooled his friend once again. However, the thrill was short-lived and Michael began to feel the first pangs of loneliness creeping in once again. Feeling alone and vulnerable, Michael called Emma Sullivan, the shy girl from his class who he had a secret crush on. The sound of her hesitancy on the other end of the phone filled him with a mixture of fear and excitement. Michael enjoyed surprising Emma on the phone, and in that moment, he felt alive in a way he had not before. But as the night wore on, Michael's fear and loneliness grew. The silence was deafening, and every creak and groan of the old house seemed to amplify his fear. He felt like he was being watched, and the thought of someone or something breathing heavily into the receiver sent shivers down his spine. As the night drew on, Michael lay awake in his bedroom listening to every small sound the old house made and wondering who or what was on the other end of that mysterious call. He had to find a way to escape the fear and loneliness that had taken hold of him and he was determined to find a way out of the darkness. The night before had been restless, but the first rays of sunlight streaming through the windows lifted Michael's spirits slightly. He tried to ignore the strange phone call he had received the previous evening as he prepared for the day ahead. He would tell his parents about his successful night home alone. No incidents. That was what he planned, at least until he put thoughts pen to paper. When he told his parents about his successful night home alone, they were impressed. They might not let him stay home on his own for the whole weekend but they did praise him for doing a great job of holding down the fort. Michael was proud of himself. He was on his own like never before, with no one to micromanage or judge him. But he couldn't shake that feeling that he wanted to do more, to prove to them that he was responsible enough to stay on his own for a longer stretch of time. That's when he decided to disrupt the orderly peace that had fallen over the neighborhood. He gathered a list of phone numbers, the house phones of his closest friends and his girlfriend, Emily. He was going to make a series of prank calls, but he didn't want to start with whoever he was most comfortable with. He wasn't sure if they had friends who pranked them, but he was certain that Emily was too sweet, too innocent for such games. So he started with Tim. Tim's dad answered the phone, sounding angry. John, this is the third time you've called here today. Don't you boys have anything better to do than prank each other on a Saturday? Michael froze. 
He hadn't been aware of the number of times he had called Tim's dad, but it seemed clear that he had crossed the line. Feeling apologetic, Michael hung up the phone and decided to move on to the next person on his list, Emma. But as soon as he heard her voice on the other end of the line, he hung up on her too. She had sounded frightened, and Michael felt bad. He decided to call back and tell her he was sorry, to reassure her that he wasn't serious about pranking her. But when he called again, all he heard was silence on the line. He tried calling him again, but still, only silence. Michael felt a sharp twist in his stomach. It was like he had made a mistake, that he wasn't fortunate enough to know who he shouldn't have pranked. He looked at the phone and saw that he had only one left on his list. He looked over at Emily's phone. Despite himself, Michael hesitated. Was he really brave enough to call Emily? She seemed sweet, kind, innocent, but there was something else about her that he couldn't put his finger on. Was she like all innocent girls? Or was there something else? Something darker, lurking beneath the surface? Michael didn't know, but he knew he had to find out. He picked up the phone and dialed the last number on his list. As he waited for Emma to answer, he realized that he was risking everything. If she reacted badly to his prank, it could be the end of his friendships with Tim and Seth, too, as well as his relationship with Emily. But he didn't care. He had to know that he was being brave, like he never had before. When Emma answered on the fourth ring, her voice was high-pitched, almost shrill. Michael! Emma, he said, his voice low. Listen, I'm sorry about what happened with Tim. I don't know what possessed me to prank him like that, but I was just trying to have a little fun. I just wanted to make sure you were okay, that nothing happened because of my stupidity. Emma was silent for a long moment. Michael feared that he had pushed too far, that she was going to lash out at him in anger. But when she finally spoke, her voice was soft, understanding. I understand, Michael. I don't think it was such a stupid move, honestly. It just caught Tim off guard a bit. He's my dad's workaholic, and they both hate prank calls. So maybe he didn't see it coming. Feeling a relief wash over him, Michael hung up the phone and felt good about what he had done. For once, he was brave enough to ignore who he should and shouldn't prank, to try and make sure everyone was okay. Maybe he really was becoming a more responsible, mature person. But as he hung up the phone, a shiver ran down his spine. He couldn't shake the feeling that something else was going on. Something that he couldn't quite put his finger on. But he pushed those thoughts aside. They weren't important right now. All that mattered was that he had made sure Emma was okay. He followed that up by sending her a text message, apologizing once again for pranking Tim. It took a while before anyone got back to him on that front. But once they did, he was relieved. As it turned out, Tim had just been in the middle of doing an important work project when Michael's call came through, which only made the prank more annoying. But they all knew Michael meant well, and he didn't regret the call. Emma comforted him and assured him that everything was okay. Michael was glad that his prank calls didn't lead to the downfall of his friendships, but he used it as a lesson to himself. He knew that he couldn't just prank anyone, but he also knew that he had the courage to make sure that people were okay, even when he was scared. Michael sprinted through the dilapidated suburban streets, ignoring his surroundings as he maintained an unrelenting trajectory towards freedom. His footsteps were rhythmic, echoing ominously through the cold asphalt vein that separated him from the horrors that resided in his family's home. As he ran, the once familiar neighborhood transformed into a sinister portrayal of his past. The trees lining the sidewalks twisted their arms towards him, casting ominous shadows that danced with malice. Backyard swing sets, swing with sinister swaying, their metal frames rustling with the cacophony of his fears. The melodious songs of birds, once a source of comfort, 
now echoed with a sinister ominousness that seared into Michael's nerves. His heart pounded frantically in his chest as he anticipated the sinister whispers that had plagued him the previous night, gnawing at his sanity. But his body could not sustain such punishing speed forever, as exhaustion threatened to overwhelm him. He spotted Tim's house on the horizon, like a beacon of hope in the hellscape he had come to know. With a final burst of energy, Michael launched himself up the front walk and pounded furiously on the sturdy oak door. Please be home. Please answer. He begged silently in thitching sweat, drenched breath. The door creaked open to reveal Tim. Confusion and concern etching his features at Michael's chaotic state. Dude, what's going on? Are you okay? Tim asked, beckoning his hysterical friend inside and shutting the door securely behind them. As Tim listened intently to his friend's frantic account, a cacophony of emotions surged through him. Relief at the sight of Michael. Terror as he realized the impact of his disappearance. Fear for the safety of others. And a growing sense of protectiveness that swelled in his chest. Michael. Breathing in ragged gasps, desperately struggled for control of his body. Desperately wanting to explain the events that had unfolded from that fateful call to his relentless flight. The strength in his limbs faltered. As he collapsed to the floor, he managed to expel the garbled tail between wheezing gulps of air. Tem's eyes widened in horror at the darkness of Michael's story, the tendrils of fear and confusion wrapping themselves around his thoughts like vines. Confliction knotted his brow deeper, and the weight of Tim's concern for his captive friend threatened to push him beyond his limits. The certainty of danger gnawed at Tim, fueling a primal instinct to protect his friend. He must rest. He must gather his strength. He must stand strong and steadfast. But that protector's glint is shrouded in uncertainty, like a dark mirror, reflecting a tempestuous sea of fears and doubts. As he walked Michael to the couch, seething in anguish, the whispers in the night seemed to echo through the house, whispering tales of dread and uncertainty on the darkened horizon. Tim pulled Michael onto the gentle cushions and propped him up, the desperate pleas for safety in his alarmed chocolate. Brown eyes. Rising, he disappeared into the kitchen, faster than a shadow, leaving Michael to his predicament and the night that threatened to consume him whole. As Tim crossed the room, the shadows lining the walls seemed to come alive, casting ominous silhouettes that danced with malevolence. The chains of uncertainty bound Michael to a maze of fear and confusion, his heart racing like a madman, desperately desperate for someone to save him from the night's clutches. Michael hunched over and heaved, the strangled sobs barely human, his body racked with a deep, shuddering exhaustion, his pleas for help, his cries for sanctuary, returned to the air in quiet, tattered fragments. Sobs breaking through the shroud of the night like a person drowning in a cold, unforgiving sea. Stirring from his reverie, Tim returned to the living room, his face a grim mask of worry. The sun was setting, and the darkness of night was beginning to consume the world. He watched anxiously, searching for any signs of the danger he sensed was lurking just beyond the reach of his sight. With a start, Tim noticed something. Shifting, shifting shadows seemingly flickering in the dusk, movement hidden just beyond the range of his vision. In that moment, Michael's eyes widened in terror, his heart hammering in his chest as the shadows took on sinister forms, monstrous figures that threatened to plunge him into the abyss of darkness. Across the room, Michael's frantic fingers began to scratch the surface of the coffee table clawing desperately at the wooden surface, like a person desperately trying to free themselves from an unseen trap. His breath 
came in ragged gasps, his lifeblood rushing through him as he fought for survival in the face of an enemy. He could not see, but could feel with every ounce of his being. Jolting from his reverie, Tim raced over to his friend, his heart pounding with the urgency of the situation. Gripping Michael's shoulders tightly, he tried to calm him down, summoning all the strength he had left to reassure his hysterical friend. But the darkness was already taking hold, threatening to consume both of them in its unforgiving embrace. As the shadows stretched out towards them, gripping the maze of fear and confusion that surrounded Michael like a suffocating blanket, Tim felt his own fear begin to rise. His protectiveness swelled, a deep, primal instinct to shield his friend from the darkness that threatened to consume them both. But even as he fought for his friend, he knew the truth. They were not alone. The whispers in the night, the sinister shadows that danced just beyond their reach, the monstrous figures that lurked in the darkness, waiting to strike, they were all part of something greater something that threatened to tear them apart in its unholy grasp. Together, they stood on the precipice of an abyss that threatened to swallow them whole, their positions wavering like a line of cards stacked too precariously. The night was filled with an unexplained terror, a darkness that seemed to whisper in the depths of their souls, speaking of a malevolence that would not acknowledge their presence. With every passing second, the darkness grew stronger, its inky tendrils reaching out with an insatiable hunger, seeking to claim them as its own. Tim and Michael, united by their fear and desperation, clung to each other, their determination to fight for survival clawing at their hearts like a living thing. But the darkness was relentless, its sinister grasp reaching out like a cold, dark hand, threatening to snuff out their hopes, their dreams, their very will to survive. The whispers in the night grew louder, the shadows more oppressive, the monstrous figures inching closer with every passing moment. And as the darkness closed in, Tim and Michael knew that their greatest test was yet to come. They were no longer alone, and the enemy would not rest until they had claimed them. Together, they would stand against the darkness, and in doing so, they would discover what they were truly capable of surviving. For in the depths of the night, where the shadows danced with sinister intent, and the whispers called relentlessly. There is a realm of unknown terror and darkness, and it is in that realm that we discover what we are made of. Will they be able to fight off the monsters lurking in the shadows? Or will they succumb to the despair that threatens to consume them? As they stand on the precipice of an abyss, their hearts pounding like thunder, and their breath coming in ragged gasps, Tim and Michael must find the strength to face the darkness and claim victory over it. Only then will they be able to emerge from the night and embrace the light that waits beyond. Despite his earlier promises, Tim was drowning in uncertainty about how to safely rescue himself and Michael from the precarious situation they now faced. As the first rays of dawn broke over the horizon, Joey's tired eyes revealed their frayed nerves and exhaustion etched years into both boys' young faces. Something sinister had taken residence in the neighborhood under the cloak of darkness, haunting the friendless boy with an unyielding brutality. Michael's terrifying recollections, shared frantically by the back door during their last moments of darkness, only sealed the grim reality. For all its deceptive innocence, the neighborhood had become a breeding ground for monsters that fed off fear and thrived in the shadows, faced with no other alternative. Survival instincts triumph, aged over fear of the unknown, as Joey tugged the curtains closed, 
shielding their bodies from the sun's scorching rays, Tim declared their fate was sealed. It's time to take to the open road, he said, before the darkness closes in again. Joey nodded numbly. Haunted by the thought of another night, alone in the maddening twilight world they now inhabited. Urgently, they retrieved their backpacks filled with scarce supplies, including extra clothes, water bottles, and non-perishable snacks. Joey snatched a pocket knife from the kitchen drawer on their way out, a playful act of rebellion against the unseen threat that lurked beyond their home. With stolen glances over their shoulders, Joey and Tim slipped away like desperate fugitives, navigating the deserted streets as best they could. An eerie calm had descended over the once lively neighborhood, stifling the usual sounds of nature and humanity alike. Joey felt the tendrils of fear curling up his spine, an inexorable sense of loss of control gnawing at his sanity. They walked for hours, under the unforgiving summer sun, the once familiar streets transformed into a gaunt landscape of decay and despair. Joey watched as the crisp lawns and cookie, cutter homes, gave way to dilapidated tenements, festering wounds in the landscape, brought about by rampant urban decay. Here, neglected hunting hounds roamed freely and barked hoarsely through the weed, choked alleys, their emaciated forms eerily echoing the disembodied howls that haunted their every footstep. Abandoned teens loitered lazily on porch steps. Their hollow eyes tracked Joey's every movement as he passed. In this wasteland, devoid of hope or sanctuary, Joey felt the first stirrings of real despair. They seemed to be walking not merely through the streets, but into an insidious abyss of uncertainty, their only beacon of light the fading memories of a happier time. Gradually, they spotted a dimly lit shop nestled between overgrown weeds and decaying machinery. The peeling sign outside read, Jim's Store, the last remnant of a once prosperous business, swallowed by the inexorable march of time. Joey and Keenan exchanged hesitant glances, sensing that the man inside might be their salvation or their doom. With a mix of fear and anticipation, they pushed through the sticky door and ventured into the gloom beyond. Inside, the air was thick with the acrid smell of tobacco smoke hanging heavily in the air like an executioner's noose. The feeble light from a solitary bulb cast shadows of decay and despair across the cracked walls and floors, imbuing the cavernous space with an eerie sense of foreboding. A wizened old man with sunken eyes and calloused hands studied them impassively through a cloud of smoke. His gaze lingered on their clothes, scrutinizing their every stitch and thread, as if searching for some hidden truth concealed within their fabrics. Clearly, the man held sway over their destinies, and either they gained his trust or met an untimely end. Joey gulped nervously, praying that their paltry offering of money would be sufficient to appease the enigmatic shopkeeper. What do you want here? The man grunted, his voice a raspy whisper that echoed off the walls and sent shivers down Joey's spine. Joey coughed up a throaty, um, sorry to bother you, hoping it would be enough to settle their nerves and sow a thread of hope between them. Unapologetically, slipping onto the precarious bicycle seat behind an uneasy friend, Michael and Tim embarked on a journey into the abyss of the forest, their path illuminated only by a weakly filtering moonlight. The wedding vows, till death do we part echoed in Michael's mind as he tried to keep up with Tim's pedaling rhythm, a sense of unease gnawing at his insides. Tim guided the way through the eeriously silent forest. The pair crouched like spies and hunters, scanning the shadows for any hint of disturbance. 
Michael gripped Tim's shoulder unsteadily, his heart pounding in his chest. Despite their initial fear, Tim found comfort in Michael's grasp, and he whispered reassuringly, This isn't real. It can't be. But their tranquility was shattered when they stumbled upon a fearsome clearing, a twisted testament to whatever horrors lay hidden in the forest, a grisly scene of bloody dismemberment and recent activity played out before them, evoking yelps of disgust from the unseen animals lurking in the undergrowth. Tim dismounted the bike, white-knuckled and breathless, as he stared at the pockmarked earth. A metallic tang saturated the air, and Michael's stomach sank lower with each passing moment. But what confirmed their suspicions was the undeniable sight of an empty bullet casing nestled in the softer dirt, its spiral asserting its grim and inescapable presence. With the wind whistling through the trees and the sound of rushing water echoing in the distance, the two boys pedaled frantically, their pulse quickening with every passing second. The darkness seemed to swallow the light behind them, and Michael's heart raced within his chest. As the night wore on, Wariness threatened to overpower them, but they managed to push beyond their limits, powered by a grim determination. Hours turned into an eternity. The moon waxing and waning in a cruel parody of hope. Their journey back was a bleak interlude to their dark tale, their tired eyes scanning every step and shadow they passed. Finally, the first light of dawn began to filter through the trees, jolting them back to reality. As the sun rose, they pulled over to the side, panting and gasping for breath. The once fighting Tim and Michael now shared a daring and evocative connection, their fear and physical intimacy merging into a unified front. We need to go, Tim whispered, his voice barely above a whisper. We need to tell someone with the promise of hope on the horizon and the monstrous forces of the darkness. Hunting them down, they wheeled the bike into a small clearing where a gravel road awaited them. What they found there would change not only their lives, but also the world forever. Desperate and slipping, Tim and Michael stumbled out of the sheriff's station onto the barren landscape of the car park. As their ghostly figures emerged from the tree line, the sudden appearance of shaken men sent shockwaves through a burly cop who rushed to greet them, his eyes intact as he took in their disheveled appearances. Boys, what the hell happened to you two? Where have you been? He clung to them protectively, eliciting a torrent of halting words tumbling from Michael's cracked lips. Between heavy breathing and choking gulps, he recounted the nightmare that unfolded, each unspeakable horrors building tension until the officer's face had ashen, until the officer's face had ashen and his eyes had darted back to the guilt, ridden trees. With a curt nod, he led the boys to the rickety station and commanded his colleagues to shift, his voice trembling with emotion. Within minutes, an emergency car roared up bearing taut, faced medics who lunged at Tim and Michael, checking their vitals and hydration levels without hesitation. You two, sit tight. Now. We're gonna find you some answers, he growled as he retreated, leaving the trembling boys concise and bleeding inside. Michael fell under the bench, his flesh shrinking as relief flooded him with each passing moment. His pulse quickened and his breath exploded with relief as the adrenaline finally subsided, leaving his limbs with a fear still encroaching twilight. Tim gripped his hand, his eyes locked onto him with an intensity that mirrored the shock of his ordeal. The door burst open and Michael's mother rushed to him, her body shaking with sobs as she clasped him tight and showed no restraint in expressing her worry. His father rushed to stand protectively behind his wife, his once calm face a battle between anger and fear. 
Oh my God, what happened to you? We were so worried when we got home and you were nowhere to be found. She choked out, her hands eliciting a trembling response from her son's trembling fingertips. Michael hesitated, his heart dropping. It was his turn now to confront his parents with the truth of his experience, to tell them everything from the twisted calls to the gruesome discovery he and Tim had made in the forest. By the time his story came to an end, his parents' faces bore expressions that were shockingly similar to the officers earlier. A stern lieutenant emerged from the shadows, breaking the silence with authority. Boys, I know you've been through hell, but we need your help once more, he growled. Take us to the place where you found the message. The clearing, too. With steely resolve, Michael nodded and led his father and the officers to the large map adorning the wall. His trembling hand traced over the green roads etched into the map, his eyes flicking over each landmark as he filled his father's ears with calculated distance estimates. As the officers huddled around the map, listening intently to Michael's account, the lieutenant then turned to him. Michael, we're heading deeper in now. Bring nine and extra muscle. Michael hesitated, his pulse quickening with his realization of the gravity of the situation. It was time to face the darkness once more, and this time he might not have the strength to carry forward. Okay, Lieutenant, he murmured as he led the by. Now tense group towards the exit. As they vanished into the deepening forest, Michael seized a flicker of hope, not daring to imagine that the long night might at last lift. Hours dragged too painfully by as a slow, wary parade of activity spread beyond the station's walls. Michael's heart grew dangerously heavy with dread as he listened to the chatter of the radio, hoping with every crackle that they might finally grasp at the edge of some elusive clue. With grueling determination, 